Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is the uh, audience participation extravaganza part of the program. And um, for the third year running, a key part of the foundation's annual meeting is to focus on a particular aspect of myotonic dystrophy and hear about the symptoms that people are experiencing. The patient voice. And the goal of the session today is to drill down on the question of changes that people have over time. And I'll come back to why that's an important question and why we're focusing on it in a minute. But we really want to try and today hear from patients and family members about what it's like to live with this condition as it's progressing. Um, how do people handle the changes that they experience? What are the most important changes that they experience? Do they have any observations about what made things get worse or what made things get better? Um, and a key question wrapped up in this is, if there was a treatment that would affect the progression of myotonic dystrophy, what would be the most important effects for that treatment to have, in your opinion? And the reason that we're holding these sessions and, and why these have become a cornerstone of the annual meeting have been that um, the experiences of patients and family members turn out to be a key ingredient in designing clinical trials, therapeutic trials, the, the testing of new drugs that's done to determine if drugs are effective. And myotonic dystrophy presents some challenges for testing new medications. And one of the biggest challenges is that people have such different experiences with the disease, that there's so much variability from one person to the next, even within a family, in terms of how, how people are affected. And so it's important for drug developers and researchers, and also for regulators, uh, people at the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, to um, try to understand the scope of the problem and how different people experience it and contend with it. So your input in this process is critical, and the foundation has served as a way to focus people's attention on the experiences of patients. In particular, a question comes up when you do a clinical trial, how do you keep score? How do you tell if the drug is helping people or if it isn't? And you have to have a very carefully defined way for doing that, and it turns out that a critical determinant of whether a trial is successful, by successful I mean it, it actually tells whether the drug works or whether it doesn't, is how you design it and how you make the measurements. And so a lot depends upon that. So during this session, we're hoping to hear about the progression of myotonic dystrophy in several different ways. We're interested in just how changes over time are contributing to the overall burden of the disease, getting some ideas about what the trajectory of the progression is. That's the natural history. What's, what, how does the condition behave over time if it's not under treatment? Um, how it impacts people's daily lives? Um, are there any of treatments that people take now that seem to be having useful effects? Um, wh what is the scope of the need that people have right now that's completely not addressed at all with any current therapies, the unmet need. Um, I mentioned about trial endpoints. That means the measurements that are made in a trial to determine if uh, medication is working. It's important to hear about people's tolerance for risk. Drugs are prescribed based on the hope of getting benefit, but also recognizing Every drug has risk, and weighing the risks and the benefits is a critical part of prescribing medications, determining who should take them, and licensing new drugs. So um, I think the, the foundation deserves a lot of credit for focusing people's attention on this. It was, I think, 
revelatory for the people at the Food and Drug Administration in 2015 when the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation sponsored uh, a regulatory workshop. That was at the 2015 annual meeting. And that workshop was attended by quite a few people from the Food and Drug Administration. And there were speakers from the FDA at the meeting talking about how it is that they make their decisions about how to approve drugs. Um, there were 80 people who came who were in the business of making drugs or doing research on myotonic dystrophy. And a report was published, um, as is listed on the slide. And then a key event in 2016 was that the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation sponsored the first patient-focused drug development meeting devoted exclusively to myotonic dystrophy, and that was a landmark event. Now, the FDA had been holding sessions like this on site at the Food and Drug Administration for a few other rare diseases. And as they got this kind of input from patients, they have decided that this is very important input for them to have, and it helps the regulators understand about the diseases that they later may be passing judgments on licensing new drugs. And the 2016 meeting was the first meeting where the FDA sort of handed the reins, so to speak, for the planning and execution of one of these meetings to an entity outside of the agency. And that agency was the, the, the entity they handed that off to, was the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation. They organized what was really a spectacularly successful session on patient-focused drug development. And it really was kind of wide-ranging. It was designed to sort of capture the totality of the experience of myotonic dystrophy in the eyes of patients and family members. And that also had a, an important output that was published and is available to everyone now. And then the 2017 iteration of this was then to focus on one specific set of symptoms, and that's how does myotonic dystrophy affect the central nervous system. And there was a session just like the one we're having today where people spoke about their central nervous system symptoms, effects on alertness and sleepiness and sleep and other things like that. And today we're focusing on uh, progression of myotonic dystrophy. And um, I think it should be a lively session because it's the, it's the biggest meeting um, so far in the series. Um, and it's also, I think, attended by more different people from drug development companies. More different companies are represented, I think, at this meeting than at any of the previous ones. And um, the outcome of this session also will be summarized and published. And so the question is, why, why would we focus on progression of myotonic dystrophy? And let's say that, um, well, I think it's the ambition of every drug developer and researcher to contribute to getting a medication for myotonic dystrophy that actually makes people feel better and um, do more. But um, it's not necessarily the case that the first treatments for myotonic dystrophy would actually cause improvement. Maybe that would be one step too far for the first medications. Maybe the first medications will stop the progression of myotonic dystrophy or slow it down. And so it's important for people who work in the drug development industry to get a sense of what kind of progression is taking place and how people notice it in their day-to-day -day lives, what the impact is. If there isn't a clear understanding of how disease changes over time, there's really no hope of trying to measure whether a drug is having that effect. And so not having a clear understanding of that is definitely a barrier to getting companies involved in making treatments for myotonic dystrophy. And so this is this, the point of the session today is to capture your all perspective on what changes are taking place. And we'd like to focus in on four different questions that are listed here. Um, I'll read them. Partly, so describe a time when your disease took a turn for the worse. And maybe there was a trigger for it, and you could um, explain what that trigger was. Maybe there was a time where it got better, and maybe there was a trigger for that. We'd like to hear about that as well. And if there are situations that seem to make things worse, what are they? And 
what strategies are you currently using to adapt to changes as they take place? And if there was a drug treatment, what would be most significant for you in terms of something that would slow things down in terms of progression? And the format of the session is to start with five individuals who have kindly um, volunteered or maybe in some cases been slightly drafted to, <laughs> to come up and try and address these questions. And um, so they've had some time to think about this and their remarks will be really focused right on these exact topics. And after we hear from them, then we're gonna open things up and ask for participation from the audience as a whole. Um, so I think um, for, for me, it would be best if we could just um, start at this end of our panel and maybe just progress down in sequence and then uh, go forward that way. I thought we might start at the other end. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, just to start with an introduction, my name is Dean Sage. I'm from San Diego. Um, in terms of the disease, I was diagnosed, my brother and I were both diagnosed uh, with myotonic dystrophy type 1 in 2010. And since that time, I've definitely noticed changes and some progression of the symptoms. But uh, different from some of the other people on this panel, maybe, I feel like my progression has, has been a little more gradual. Uh, it's difficult for me to pinpoint any specific events or incidents that really led to uh, a more pronounced progression or made the symptoms uh, become worse in a, in a rapid fashion. Uh, on a similar note, it's also difficult to identify any factors um, that trigger an onset of, of symptoms worsening. Personally, I have noticed that periods of stress can exacerbate symptoms, specifically in my case, uh, fatigue and the excessive daytime sleepiness. And that's stress just in my personal life or professional life. Um, if I try to take on too many things or just become overwhelmed, then I can definitely notice that I get run down more easily and just need to give myself more breaks. Uh, in terms of, of treatments that I have experienced that have, that have benefited, uh, the medications that I'm on have probably led to the most um, dramatic changes. So uh, early after diagnosis, I w began taking modafinil uh, or Provigil or Nuvigil, and that really was a game changer in the way that I manage um, the excessive daytime sleepiness. I can identify back as far as high school, just coming home and immediately, immediately needing to lay down or take a nap or just sleep all the time. And that worsened over time um, through college and grad school and then even in the workplace. And ever since taking uh, modafinil, it's just been, it's just really has like changed my life for the better that I can sort of live um, a more normal life, so to speak. And uh, it's just enabled me to have a more productive lifestyle. Um, I'm also taking mexilatine, which is maybe a lesser known medication. Um, but for me personally, I think it has varying degrees of success. But in my case, it really has alleviated a lot of the myotonia uh, in my face, hands, and feet. And so while it hasn't necessarily affected my lifestyle, it just definitely makes things more comfortable um, on a day-to-day -day basis. The third thing that I've uh, worked worked on getting better at is um, self-care and making that a priority. Uh, I try to adjust the standards that I hold myself to and not hold myself to the standards that I used to, but sort of understand that the symptoms are the cause for some of what I, what I previously described as laziness or lack of motivation or when I don't uh, accomplish what I intend to accomplish, then I just understand that that's not necessarily my fault and I don't I try not to beat myself up too much, but just allow myself that some days I'm going to need to take a break or take it slow or take a day off, and, and that's okay. Uh, one of the most difficult parts about dealing with this disease for me is the unpredictable nature of the progression. Uh, I can look at my abilities and restrictions and limitations as they are today, 
but I don't know what those are going to be in six months or a year or five years. And I can look at where I'm at today and sort of accept that and make adjustments to my expectations, but it's, it's sort of a moving target trying to predict where I'll be in the future. And so for me, that's hard to sort of wrap my head around or accept. Um, and that's something that I've, that I've struggled with, I think, since, since diagnosis um, initially. So that being said, uh, meaningful treatments, I think anything that stopped the progression would be fantastic. Uh, I think the ability to know that your symptoms and your limitations are, are more or less fixed would really help with what I was just speaking about, about uh, planning for the future and knowing sort of where you'll be. Obviously, there will be additional changes that, that just occur naturally with age, but knowing what your disease symptoms are and knowing that they're not necessarily going to worsen would, would be huge and would just be, um, that would just really, uh, I think everyone can agree, that would just really uh, lessen the burden of this disease. Uh, as Dr. Thorne said, um, slowing, the, slowing the progression would be nice, but in my case, the progression is so gradual and so unpredictable that I'm not even sure that I would notice or be able to identify if the progression had, in fact, um, slowed, unless it was like over a 10-year period, ten, ten, ten period of time. And I know there are uh, discussions and some treatments on the horizon that that look promising and that could even uh, potentially reverse some of the symptoms. Um, and that's really uplifting and hopeful, but I think it's also important that we manage our expectations. Um, and so anything that would slow the progression or stop the progression uh, would be fantastic. Thank you. Sorry, Bry from San Francisco, and I have DM1. <coughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Sorry, Bry from San Francisco, and I have DM1. I was diagnosed in 2009 after experiencing myotonia for several years. I was uh, finally referred to a neurologist who did an EMG test and confirmed that I had myotonic dystrophy and then subsequently doubly confirmed with a genetic test. Like most of my symptoms of weakness and myotonia have progressed gradually, but the ones that affect me the most are my cardiac symptoms. Upon my diagnosis, I was referred to a cardiologist who did an EKG and realized I was having a form of arrhythmia called atrial flutter. They admitted me in the hospital right away and finally did a procedure called a cardiac ablation to treat the atrial flutter. It all happened really fast. I mean, within a month of my diagnosis, my whole world had seemed to turn upside down. But my problems had just begun. Upon subsequent follow-ups with the cardiologist, they diagnosed me with a, another form of arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation, which was, as they call, more chaotic than atrial flutter. And for that, I needed to have two more cardiac ablation surgeries to treat that. As if that wasn't enough, a few years later, after a few dizzy spells, I had a Holter test, which diagnosed me with a second degree heart block. And at that point, they said, they needed to go ahead with the uh, implanted pacemaker come defibrillator. Within two weeks of my, me getting my ICD, my atrial fibrillation sent my heart rate over 200 beats a minute setting off my ICD, and I got shocked twice within a minute and had to be rushed to the ER. This by far had been the biggest setback for me in my disease. As for things that have helped me over the years, I've learned to listen to my body, become more aware of my body, and I realize that stress and lack of sleep are two things that make my symptom worse. If I haven't slept well the previous day, my myotonia acts up even more, I'm more tired and find it hard to get through the day. And 
can learn to manage both, but the management comes with certain costs and sacrifices. I changed my lifestyle, making sure I went to bed early so I get adequate sleep and to be able to get through work next day. I modified my diet to reduce my GI symptoms. But these changes basically put a stop to my social life. It was hard for people around me to understand why I was tired all the time and could not get together with friends for dinners or gatherings on weekdays why I was so picky about what I ate. It's hard to explain people the myriad manifestations of this disease. It took me more than a year to process my DM1 diagnosis. I went through the usual cycle of denial, anger, depression, and finally acceptance. But I believe I came out of it stronger and with a will to fight DM1. I became what this community commonly calls a DM warrior. I planned a holistic approach to fight my disease, physically, mentally, and spiritually. Exercise and diet were the first two big changes I made. These brought immediate effects of more energy and not only slowing my muscle atrophy, but also building strength in some parts of my body. Exercise also made me feel happier and reduce stress. Subsequently, I also incorporated a meditation practice which reduced stress, depression, and allowed me to have more faith. I know the scientific community here is working hard and doing their best to help us, but I just want to express how anxious we are. Just like the saying goes, a drowning man will clutch at a straw. I would take anything, anything that just slows down the progression of the muscle wasting and lets me lead a productive life. Anything that slows or prolongs the inevitable we all fear. But I also wanted to stress on the CNS aspect of this disease. I know I'm not the person I was and I'm definitely not the person I wanted to be. I have lost motivation and find it hard to focus. But one of my constant battles is how much of it is a part of the disease and how much of it is really me. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kristen Vasallo. I'm 47 years old. I'm from Austin, Texas, and I have DM1. Like many moms I've met, I found out that I had myotonic dystrophy after the birth of my twins in 2005. My delivery was both the best day of my life and certainly the hardest day of my life. Jack, my son, came first, and immediately we knew something was wrong. He was floppy. He wasn't crying. It was very scary. I lost a lot of blood during my delivery, and we weren't sure I would be able to go on in terms of blood transfusions and those types of things, but I was able to stop, the doctors were able to stop the bleeding. But with Jack, we had no warning. My daughter was thriving, she was crying, and pink and my son was floppy. He had clubbed feet and he went to the NICU immediately after birth. He stayed there for about 10 days and numerous tests were um, given to him and there was no diagnosis at that time. And after 10 days we were able to take him home. So I thought the struggle was over and we would deal with club feet and it would be fine and we'd move on. Then about six weeks later, after I had Jack and my daughter Ellie home, I got a call from our pediatrician, and he said, Kristen, I have some news. And I said, okay. And he said, Jack has myotonic dystrophy. And I said, is that bad? <laughs> I had no idea. And he said, it's very, very bad. So I did what a lot of people did, and this is pre MDF, I went to the internet, 
or as Rob likes to say, Dr. Google. And I saw the most horrendous things I've ever seen. I'm looking at my little child and I saw terrible information and pictures of what I thought may lie ahead for Jack. My husband and I both got immediately tested and we all thought it was the other one. And, um, and, and then I was diagnosed. That was devastating. The fact that I as a mother had something that passed down to my son and gave him this disease was the most devastating thing I've ever heard. Nothing made sense. I was mad at myself. I was also sleep deprived, taking care of two babies. Um, this is hard on a marriage. We fought and then we stopped fighting and there was not a lot of conversation. And I looked at myself and I thought, I have got to figure out how to deal with this and cope with this for my family, for my children, and for my marriage. So I looked for a therapist to talk this through, and I went to three before I found the perfect one. I will say that I went to one, and she started crying as I told my story. And I said, well, this is not going to work. And after about eight months with my therapist, she recommended that I try medication. And I thought, oh, that's not me. I don't, ooh, I don't need medication. I didn't like to take aspirin for a headache. I certainly don't need medication. But again, I was doing this for something larger than myself. So I tried it. And let me tell you, it works. Um, I'm learning to stay present and curious about the future not to assume things are gonna be great or gonna be bad. Um, and I still follow that advice. And I'm still in therapy and I still take medication for depression. It took me about eight years after Jack was born to really look into myself and start to look at my symptoms and manage those. And again, that motivation was, Jack is gonna need me much longer than a typical child is going to need me. So I need to be strong and I need to take care of myself for him. So my symptoms thus far, first there were cataracts when I was about, actually quite after the kids were born, I was about 36, had surgery. Now it's forgetting names and dates. Um, there's muscle weakness, my jaw tightening, the myotonia, sometimes slurring words choking from time to time on harder foods. But the sleepiness and the fatigue are by far the worst problem for me. After a long week of work, I really need to recover over the weekend. That means taking naps, sleeping 10 hours, 12 hours. But it's always difficult for me to get up every morning, regardless of how much sleep I've had. I felt like myotonic dystrophy has stolen from me the person that I was. I used to do triathlons and marathons. I loved running. I had a fast-paced job working for the mayor of Austin and then running his campaign for attorney general. And believe it or not, my husband and I were named Austin's 2004 power couple by our local newspaper. Okay, you can clap for that, but that was a long time ago, folks. <laughs> but I'm not that person anymore. Myotonic dystrophy has certain diminished me in many ways. There's no more pushing my limits. I do lots of yoga now and walk. And I'll tell you this, if I don't exercise, I feel much worse. So there's a motivation to continue the yoga and continue staying active as I can. I try to eat very well. I take probiotics. And to reclaim the person I once was, to, divide, to fight the disease that stole from me, 
I embrace therapy and medication. Taking Provigil and antidepressants have been game changers for me. Through therapy and medication, I'm closer to the person I was in 2004, and I might be a bit better. I'm not sure that power couple is in our future, but therapy has helped this alpha hard charger realize that life is not always in my control, that there is a lesson to be learned that I might not have learned if it weren't for the first years of this diagnosis and how difficult that was. I'm still working full time, but I have a great job that gives me flexibility for me and my family. Jack and his sister Ellie are thriving 13 year olds, and I don't know what the future holds. I try to stay curious and really present with my family. And most days I feel really lucky. But let me be clear to all of you who are doing the research, who are producing the medications, any clinical therapy that would slow or stop the progression of this disease would be incredible for me and my family. For now, I've managed the disease, but the future progression is frightening for me and for so many of us and our children. We are parents and grandparents, brothers, sisters, we cope daily, but live in the fear that the floor is going to give beneath us. I'm not asking for easy. I'm just asking for a break and a hope. Thank you. My name is Judith Kroll. I'm 70 years old. I'm from Austin, and I retired from teaching about seven years ago, shortly before I was diagnosed with type 2 myotonic dystrophy. But before then, since 1988, the, for 25 years, I had been diagnosed then with paramyotonia congenita which is a non-dystrophic myotonic condition. And that's what I had for, a uh, thought I had for all those years. So whatever uh, the development of symptoms, a lot of them took place in the context of thinking I had something else, which wasn't particularly scary because I was told it wasn't progressive. For a couple of years before that diagnosis, I'd been under great stress. I'd been living in India with my husband. The marriage broke up and I moved back to the US with my small son. The symptoms, which I didn't yet think of as symptoms, just weird things that happened to me, um, the symptoms that began before the paramyotonia diagnosis included painful sensitivity to cold, grip myotonia, and weakness of my hands and thighs. Those things gradually became more annoying, and I also developed something new, which was sensitivity to dental anesthesia. That had never bothered me before, but now it started making me feel dizzy and sick. Some months after that, I had general anesthesia for laparoscopic surgery, and it took me more than three months to recover from that. So I realized there's something about anesthesia, and if, if it's up to me that if I don't have an accident, something like that. Um, I'm very careful about it. Even an, an injection of lidocaine or cutting my finger can knock me out for a day. So I have to be careful about that. And also in that same, I just had a lot of medical things happening 
in a short period of time. And in that same period, I came down with malaria and was hospitalized because of their reaction to chloroquine, uh, which was given to me in large doses to knock out the malaria. And insofar as triggers are concerned, one of the big ones I discovered was altitude. Uh, li living in India, I often, like, dozens and dozens of times, would go from maybe almost sea level up to 7,000 feet, which isn't a huge altitude for mountain climates and so on. But I, I would do that in one day and never had any problem. Uh, and then seven years ago, when I made that same trip that I'd done 10 months before with no problem, when I did that, I felt really fatigued, short of breath, that I couldn't breathe. Uh, even if I was just sitting, or maybe especially if I was just sitting and reading, or if I bent down to pick something off the floor. All I could think of was that it might be mountain sickness, but I'd never had mountain sickness, and it, it, I, I had no idea why this was suddenly happening. Then when I left that altitude, the problem disappeared and I thought, well, it was the altitude for some reason after all these years bothering me. But then when I went back to America, Texas, which was fairly flat compared to that, I started feeling fatigued and breathless even then. Uh, and shortly after that, I lost my balance and fell and was in a, uh, fractured my ankle badly. I was in a nursing facility for two and a half months. And then at home, where I had in-home care. So there was a long period of time when I was really not active at all. And looking back, I think that that really just not doing anything and spending a lot of time in bed was a trigger for a kind of full-blown stage that is a lot more things happening, like dysphagia. I could not swallow even my own, I choke on my own saliva for no reason at all. Uh, I finally had a DNA test in 2014, and then I went to the myotonic dystrophy clinic at Houston Methodist Hospital. The pulmonologist there right away prescribed an AVAPS machine, that's a, like a BiPAP that controls your breathing in, your breathing out, the space between breaths, um, using pressure and resetting itself for the volume that you breathe, so to keep it steady. So I've eat, but even with that, I was getting no restorative sleep at night at all. This is according to four sleep studies that I've had so far. Um, I get zero restorative sleep, which isn't great. So in the daytime, I take modafinil and also Adderall to help with that daytime sleepiness and to focus more. And I also, also take an antidepressant. And at night, I have a small dose of something like um, estazolam, a kind of mild something, whatever, and, and gabapentin, and also naproxen. Other things that have helped 
are physical therapy, aqua therapy, yoga breathing. I found that most things are of some help, but they don't help enough and or the whole attempt to find a way to treat is too improvised and too hit and miss. So it's hard to know what's, it's hard to know what's going on. And I'd say, especially since at my age, aging itself is progression and those symptoms can get mixed up in my mind. But in any case, what I would really like most for what's bothering me is something that would have therapy that would help with my breathing. That's what impacts me and I notice every day it's um, feeling dizzy and tired because I'm not breathing properly. So anything that would help could also affect progression, I'm thinking, because it's treating muscle weakness overall, and it would be important to prevent rebreathing carbon dioxide that's left in your lungs because you don't have the strength to breathe it out again with each breath. So you're not getting enough oxygen coming in, you're not getting rid of the carbon dioxide going out. And the other thing that really bothers me is um, pain, well, which kind of comes and goes as periods when it's bothering me a lot for a period of days and then maybe not for a while. But that also seems dangerous. I've been, I stumble sometimes and fall and the myotonia is very unpredictable. I could be sitting here this whole time, it doesn't bother me, and then I get up to go, I don't know, answer the door, doorbell or something, and I stumble because just get this really sharp pain. My muscles are doing weird things, and um, it's hard to, to keep on being aware of that every minute. Uh, and I've tried a Mexitil, and that hasn't worked. So at the same time, I like the idea of being able to control to some degree when and how often and in what form I could take a, a pain therapy. And because pain can also wake you up at night, even if you aren't aware of it, Um, I'm thinking that an extended release form of something, but Tylenol, say, doesn't do it. You know, eight-hour Tylenol or something like that doesn't, doesn't do that. Um, might be useful at night, and it might be nice to have the option of having an extended release kind of thing in the daytime or else using a short a short-term immediate release drug because sometimes I'm not in the mood to take something and know that for eight hours or whatever it's going to still be affecting me when uh, I, I, I somehow feel sometimes that I don't mind putting up with pain because I, I don't want to keep taking the strongest possible medications because it leaves me nowhere to go if it starts getting worse. So I, I feel of divided mind about that. I also like the idea of doing as much as possible to stabilize the sleep-wake cycle because doing that would improve 
everything, I think all the symptoms I have, um, and, and keep them from progressing. If you could just sleep when you're supposed to be sleeping properly and be properly awake when you're supposed to be awake, that would be enormous. Um, my name is Lorraine Pihota. Um, I'm 46 years old, and I was diagnosed with DM2 back in 2015 after a number of other probable diagnoses um, in the 16 years or so prior, um, things like anxiety, postpartum depression, probable MS, fibromyalgia, and even ALS. Um, so that being the case, um, I'm probably one of the few people that you will meet who actually cry tears of joy um, when giving their um, likelihood of DM2 and that final genetic confirmation. Um, <clears throat> from a mobility standpoint, um, I'm fairly capable um, and I consider myself very fortunate. Uh, I can walk without any aids on most days. Um, I must admit that a shopping cart has become a necessity at the grocery store um, because um, most days, more so than using it for support, it's about my inability to hold anything with any weight to it for any length of time. Um, I'm not going to talk about stairs today because that ability is long gone. Um, however, I can say that just because I cannot do something today, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that I won't be able to do it tomorrow or next week. Um, so in terms of mobility, um, I can say that my progression has been quite slow. Um, I have several areas um, which I would say have declined a great deal in the last few years, and those would be um, excessive sleepiness, upper body strength, um, considerable pain, and a mental decline. Um, back when I was first diagnosed, I had a hard time lifting anything over my head. Um, but now, just trying to brush my hair is a considerable effort on some days. Um, so luckily, I have a 16-year-old daughter at home who can help out on those rough days. Um, days that you see me wearing glasses other than my reading glasses, um, it's not because I wanted a different look for the day. It's because my tremors are so bad that I can't manage to get my contact lenses in without risking an eye. <laughs> um, in terms of pain, uh, what used to be a constant yet gnawing ache in my legs has progressed to a point where at times I actually feel like I have daggers stuck in my legs. <laughs> Um, I can't really say that I found any medication or muscle relaxant to be particularly helpful other than at night. Um, two prescription strength and proxen was enough to take the edge off and leave me functional during the day. But unfortunately, um, I'm on blood thinners long term due to family history of blood clots and unfortunately a clot in my own leg two years ago. So NSAIDs are no longer an option for me due to inc increased bleeding risk. Um, most painkillers that are left, which I find to be at all helpful, um, they make me even more sleepy. Um, so that's not really an option for me when I'm trying to work. Um, I do work full time and I'd like to remain in that capacity. Um, at least through the years that my kids are in college. Um, I'm always exhausted as it is, so adding a painkiller that makes me tired um, leaves me pretty much incapacitated. Um, I've tried Adder Adderall um, for daytime sleepiness, and for me, 
Um, what I found is that it's only effective for maybe two hours or so at best. Um, I've known some other people who have had better success with that than myself, but um, that's me. Uh, if I had to express my biggest concern with progression of this de disease to date personally, it would be the impact on my mind. Um, I was a math geek in high school and college, something called uh, mathlete. Uh, for all you athletes out there, it's, um, it's kind of like <laughs> the geek side <laughs> of things. Um, so I'm a technical architect, which is a fancy term for computer programmer analyst. Um, for years, I have loved to design and build new computer um, business applications to the degree where um, most of the time it did not even feel like work. Um, but now I'm not the same person. Um, intellectually, I've been falling apart over the last two or three years. Um, so it's very difficult to design a system when you can't recall why you made certain decisions, um, which files were going to house which data, and how you envision them all fitting together in the first place. Um, notes only work to a certain degree. <laughs> Um, anyway, some days I do find some clarity and I might be able to have a few hours of solid productivity. Um, other days I can spend hours rehashing decisions which I have already made, wondering why I decided to go one way versus another. Um, at first I thought that not having a physical job would be a great thing, given my diagnosis. Um, but over this past year, I have found myself wondering how much longer I can remain gainfully employed. Um, this is affecting my personal life as well. Um, I think my spouse and children have come to find me annoying. Uh, if they aren't repeating something because I didn't hear it, um, they are repeating it because I can't remember what we talked about yesterday or the thing I said I would take care of, but unfortunately forgot yet again. Um, the only thing that I find consistent about my problems is that they are inconsistent. Um, I have some good days, and I sincerely wish I could identify the triggers which bring on the bad, but I cannot. I've tried activity and food journals to see if I can identify a pattern and really have kind of given up there. Um, I thought that maybe the cold was a trigger, and to some degree it is, but unfortunately um, I find the heat to be um, particularly draining as well, so uh, I think I have like a five degree comfort zone. <laughs> um, I think um, the only trigger that I have identified for myself is illness in general. Um, for my husband and younger daughter, um, they can get hit by a cold or a virus and a few days later they're fine. Um, for me it's never really the, quite that simple. Um, things can linger for weeks, um, exacerbate pain, weakness, and fatigue. Um, the last few years I've been hit with pneumonia and shingles, um, and I can assure you that both were horribly unpleasant. Um, so the key is here, and you might want to write this down, this is important. Don't get sick. <laughs> um, sorry, I couldn't resist that attempt at humor. <laughs> um, so enough complaining. Um, what does work for me? Um, I think it's recognizing when I am pushing my limits. Um, it doesn't do me any good to push through any pain, discomfort, or excessive fatigue to finish a task at hand if the next day I'm completely incapacitated as a result. Um, to some degree, I'm always in a state of pain, discomfort, and fatigue, <laughs> as are many of you, I'm sure. Um, so this is kind of about common sense, um, knowing when you are testing your limits. Um, it's taken me some time to recognize that line in the sand, so to speak, and now I kind of know when enough is enough, and I hope many of you have recognized that as well. Um, 
So when I have those days, when I wake up exhausted or in pain, um, sometimes it's better to just take the sick day or vacation day and deal with it. Get the sleep I need or take the painkiller and or muscle relaxant and just be okay with losing that day. Um, because personally, the longer I put off that day of recovery, um, the longer it takes me to recover. I'm not lazy and it's not all in my head. Um, I don't know how long these methods are going to continue to work for me and to what degree anyone else might find them helpful, but that's my two cents. Um, for those of you who have days of horrible pain and ex exhaustion, um, just remember that you're not alone. Um, I think everyone in this room has been there. Um, in terms of meaningful treatment, I think anything that even slows progression would be meaningful. Um, small steps are better than none at all. Um, we do appreciate everyone out there working in research, and um, I think that these forums are great opportunities um, to speak to many of you in, in many of you in those regards. Um, I'm thankful that I have had the opportunity to speak today, and wish you all the best. Thank you. Proof that uh, if more were needed, I don't think really so, but uh, that the uh, observations of an eyewitness are invaluable. And uh, everything that all of you said was um, fabulous, revelatory, educational. Thank you so much um, for taking the time to prepare your remarks. And now, at the risk of setting off some feedback, we want to open this up. And invite your participation. And there's a, a, a format that we'd like for people to follow at least loosely, and that would be to start with your name and what your relationship with myotonic dystrophy is, how long you've been living with myotonic dystrophy, and then trying to answer um, one or more of the questions that are posed here. And those will, I'll bring those back up on the final slide, and so those will stay up on the screen if you want to refer to those. And we have a few tips for those who are willing to speak, and one of them is if you have something important to share, we'd love to hear it. We hope that it can relate to one of the questions that have been posed. It's okay if someone else has already talked about it. We want your personal perspective on things. And um, ideally, if you can keep your comments kind of on target for the question we're trying to address today, that would be great. Um, there's a lot of people and voices that we hope to hear from today. Um, Thanks for coming. Thanks in advance for those of you who are willing to share something. And um, I think even from what's happened already, it's sort of obvious how the session is, is valuable. Um, so these are the questions that we want to focus on. And I think we've got some people who are going to circulate with some microphones, or maybe we use these up here. OK. Whatever. I actually have a question. Um, the last panelist mentioned using muscle relaxants to feel better, and I thought those were very dangerous. Maybe it's just dangerous for DM1 and not DM2, but are those something we should use, is my question. Um, if you're asking me, um, I don't have any respiratory issues at this point in time. Um, I do think that um, my personal physician was comfortable 
with giving them to me. Um, I'll let Dr. Thornton speak to that in general. Um, I wouldn't think that the general population might be comfortable with that, especially DM1. Um, personally, my physician was fine with it. Hi, my name. It's so loud. Hi, my name is Laura. I have DM1. Um, I probably started with symptoms at about 12 or 13. We just, you know, hindsight's 2020. Um, when I finally was diagnosed, I went to my first PT session and um, was working with an OT and a PT. And the OT said to me, "What do you? Who's your doctor?" And I told her, and she said, "Oh, she, yeah, she works with one of the weird diseases." It's like, oh, good, now I'm weird, thanks. Um, I didn't go back there. Um, I went somewhere else. <laughs> I went home crying. I was like, I'm never going back there. Um, my daughter's been diagnosed recently. Um, my father passed away in October from complications of it. And my daughter watched him go through um, uh, all the stages, and it's been real hard to watch. Um, I've watched her go through watching the progression and how bad it was towards the end. Um, he couldn't even eat towards the end, and she was watching that. And um, she's got some, she definitely has some more um, symptoms than I would see. She's got ADHD, she takes Ritalin for that. She goes to a school that's for learning different kids. And um, she's got, you know, her speech has gotten worse over the years and it scares me, it scares me a lot. Um, and I get scared a lot that she's gonna get worse and I know she's gonna get worse and I'm not oblivious to that. And um, that's the biggest thing I see is I'm so scared because she watched my dad go through this and then die. And she's not afraid of it and she doesn't blame me. She, we've had a discussion where I lost it in front of her. And I said, I'm so sorry. And she said, I'll never blame you. I never blamed my father, but it is what it is. And the biggest thing I guess that I would hope for is that we can stop this so that it doesn't get worse. My name is Ann Woodbury, and I'm caregiver of five family members with myotonic dystrophy type 1. The thoughts that I'd like to share is most of our journey, we, we were, they were all diagnosed in 1998, and most of the time we've had a lot of hope. There's always been something new to try that made a big difference. But it seems like lately, especially well, for two family members in particular, that we've reached the maximum benefit of what there is to offer. And the quality of life is declining a lot. And I'm feeling a loss of hope. And so I'd like to reiterate that any, any hope out there would make a difference in our lives. My name is David Nixon. I'm 63. Um, I have DM1. Two of our three children um, also, um, it was passed on to them. And then uh, the son of one of our daughters has that. So we have sort of the later onset, um, early adult and uh, congenital in our family. Um, our daughter is a mathlete. Uh, I, I considered myself an athlete. Uh, and for a long, long time, one of the real joys in my life was just running. Did it started in eighth grade and ran uh, even competitively uh, at the you know different age levels uh, all the way into my uh, late forties. And I, I noticed in my uh, maybe I said I'm 63, but in my so around 47, I started noticing changes, even though I was uh, training at the time for a marathon. Uh, and I kept, over the next two, three years, I'm just thinking, I'm, I must be imagining these things, uh, atrophy in my legs, and, and then just chalking it up to, to getting older. 
Um, and, you know, it just continued and there was kind of the, the, the loss of uh, leg strength and running felt more like trying to move quickly through water and it, just getting tired uh, more quickly. And there came a point where uh, I just quit uh, because I, I thought it's not fun anymore. And, um, and it seemed to me that the progression, you know, that it, it, it progressed more quickly at that point. Uh, and I think, yeah, so that was, that was one thing. And then there was a time maybe about three years ago, two and a half years ago, I just thought, I can't do this. I have to, I have to make some changes, and uh, decided that I would just begin uh, walking uh, half a mile around our block, and then built uh, up to a mile, and then a mile and a half. And it was hard. And I would start to jog a little bit, and instead of six, seven minute miles, it was now ten to twelve minute, you know, mile pace. But uh, my. The, the two things I want to say uh, here in conclusion. One, although it's been really uh, difficult to run, uh, to stay active, I felt like when I made that internal commitment, something rose up in me and I decided, even if it's 100 yards, uh, that I got, I felt better. It, there really was a noticeable difference in me, uh, just that will and commitment, even though it didn't feel like fun to stay active. That was like a trigger that helped move me forward. Um, and the other thing was, uh, and here this may be, you know, more controversial, I don't know, but for me, I do notice that it, it made a distinct difference was uh, I, I just decided I'm going to do everything I can to eat well. And for me, that meant, uh, cutting out uh, all processed foods and saying if it, if it doesn't grow on a tree or a bush or it's you know, underground or it doesn't uh, walk around and make noises and have a face, <laughs> you know, I, I'm just not going to touch it. Um, I'm trying to be really, really careful about diet and the combination of those two things. Uh, I, I know for a fact that for me it made an immediate difference. There's still Every year there's loss, I feel it, uh, but it feels like the progression slowed and I'm, gr I'm grateful for that. No, it was just you. Okay. <laughs> My name is Linnell Brown and I'm the parent of Anna Lee who was just diagnosed in February was just diagnosed in February and right now she has a burning question but she doesn't feel like she can ask it so I'm going to ask it for her. The only medication in addition, Anne Lee was treated with hypersom, um, discovered hypersom um, maybe 10 or 12 years ago and she, uh, therefore she's been on modafinil and provigil for a long time. She was identified with learning disabilities in school and um, being a special education teacher, I agreed. And she received a lot of services. Um, but when it began to, in the last two years, affect um, her to the point that she can't raise one of her arms and that she began falling, then her, bless her, her general physician insisted that she continue uh, and go to her neurologist, who fortunately enough, um, was familiar and actually when Annalee walked in the room he said that he could see her face and she had a classic mitonic um, face and the hand grip and uh, so we, in many cases we've all the things that she has done all the medications she's done her lifestyle etc uh, except for the candy <laughs> she and her father share a sweet tooth um, but what she wants to know is the only medication other than ProVigil that she's been um, prescribed is, I believe you pronounce it carpazepine, Car and uh, she hasn't heard that word, I haven't heard that word, and where she thinks that it helps, 
but she wonders if her neurologist is up to date or if he's, you know, doing the best he can, can with what he knows. And uh, I think that for her and for her family, anything that would slow the progression, she's 32, um, would be a blessing. And uh, she's, um, although she, to some extent shy, she's also a risk taker. And I think that she would be willing to participate. In fact, she's been contacted about the U of F study because we are all Floridians. And uh, I would certainly back her. Um, and I think it's probably time for me to have my genetics tested because I'm beginning to think that it, it does run in my family, but we, nobody else was ever diagnosed. Thank you. I, I, I know Anna Lee was posing a, uh, a question, but we're going to intentionally duck that question now because we really want the session to focus on the observations of patients and family members. And I, I had a question for the, for the last gentleman who spoke, and that is, um, I think you were telling us that when you resumed your training program that you actually were able to train and you were actually able to get improvements in your athletic performance, or did I misunderstand? So, um, you know, I would consider myself a mediocre, like, college runner, but, you know, uh, back in the day I could run about a 4-12 mile and was at the age of 47, you know, shooting to break three hours in a, in a marathon, and that just wasn't going to happen anymore. <laughs> and it, it uh, so yeah, when I when I just went through a couple, t a few years of just saying, I just it hurts when I run. I, it, just, it just feels awful. I don't want to do it anymore. Um, I was thinking I'd take up biking and and just thought, give it one more shot. And as I did that, um, yeah, I went from you know walking a 20-minute you know paced half mile to walking, you know, a 20 minute paced mile. And then um, I just began to chart, like, could I, uh, internally, I'm, you know, if you're an athlete, you're kind of competitive with yourself. And so as I would, I would just start charting this and say, well, I, I did a mile in 12 minutes, I, you know, now, and let's see if, if I just stay with this, could I do a mile in 11 minutes and 45 seconds next week? And I noticed I would, you know, keep bringing it down. I, and I did notice, a, you know, uh, I don't know how sometimes I, I run because I have no calves left. I, I can't really get up like I used to be able on one foot to get up, you know, on my toe a little bit, but I can't on my left foot anymore. I can a little bit on my right. So I do more slapping, you know, when I run. Uh, but I've been able to even get down uh, with it seems like no legs or not a lot of muscle strength to like a 20, uh, um, I, I broke 26 minutes in a 5K, uh, which for my age and my legs, I think is pretty darn good. And uh, yeah, and I don't know, I, so I'm just, I'm just going to keep at it, you know, until I can't do it. And so, yes, yeah, so there was definite physical improvement. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mike. Uh, I, I've heard a lot about the uh, physical effects. Um, my, qu my question is, is more on the cognitive side. Um, like, my executive function is shot. Um, for example, even like packing for this trip, which is like, you know, two days, took me a while to figure out, you know, what I need to bring, stuff like that, planning, organizing. Um, like I have none of those skills, and they're what I had is gone. You know, I, like uh, just making decisions, stuff like that. Um, you know, if there was a, th and and that's one of my triggers. You know, like if I have something big coming up, I get overwhelmed, and I just kind of like shut down. You know, um, so like as far as I'm concerned, uh, that should be one of the, um, you know, maybe treatments is is uh, you know with the cognitive, with the, all the cognitive problems I have, you know? The apathy, the um, lack of motivation, 
you know, constant fatigue. Um, you know, that's, that's my question. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Veronica Dunning, and I was diagnosed in 2005, and I have a question for the panel. Um, I'm diagnosed with DM1, sorry about that. Does ProVigil impact your ability to fall asleep at night, or any um, wakeful sleep during the night? Uh, for me personally, it does not affect my ability to fall asleep at night. Uh, I actually believe that I can take it in the morning and so go back to sleep if that's really what I want to do. Um, but for me, the, the way that I notice the change is that I just don't have that overwhelming, like, I need to lay down right now or I'm going to die type feeling that I used to get every day at you know, noon or 1 or 2 o'clock or after lunch. Um, so that's really, really uh, the biggest benefit to me and I don't see, I don't experience any difficulty falling asleep. Um, so, yeah. Hi, I'm, uh, my name is Carolyn Valick, and I am a caregiver. I uh, have been a caregiver for 10 years, and my husband had a classic form of DM1, and his two sisters had juvenile onset forms of DM1, which we did not know at the time. And there was a third, another sister who uh, the neurologist believed had congenital. All have since died. Uh, he, my husband led a fairly normal life. I met him while I was in high school. So I've actually seen the progression of uh, DM1 for 40 years, not knowing it, but in his two sisters, his mother, and, and, and my husband. And I wanted to talk about triggers. Um, one of the triggers that I know, now looking back, I noticed was when he, we moved to a, a new house, he fell down the steps and broke his ankle. I uh, broke his elbow. And soon after that, when I say soon, within a few months, he developed cataracts very quickly. After a checkup, within three months, he could only see through a pinpoint. So it, it was an aggressive form. I wanted to talk about the progression. But the thing that really changed his life was the third fall he had, which was breaking his ankle. He fell off a ladder and broke his ankle. Obviously did not know that he had myotonic when he went on the ladder. And in the two years it took for that bone to heal, and the, and the doctor said, I've never seen a bone take so long to you know, close. Uh, he became tired all the time. He could no longer work full time. Uh, he uh, had problems with the respiratory uh, ability to breathe efficiently. So. We went on a four-year odyssey with a sleep medicine uh, doctor before we found a BiPAP. And he also had a heart block and arrhythmias. So he, he was affected in many different organs, but all of this was dramatically accelerated uh, after the ankle break. And we soon found out that he had something that it was myotonic dystrophy. So I just wanted to talk about a trigger. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the panel um, because a lot of the feelings of feeling lazy and, and not motivated affect me every day. Um, and it helped to know that other people feel that way. Um, I'm, my name is Teresa and I was diagnosed in 2011 with DM1 and um, both of my children have congenital DM1. Um, I just want to stress the importance. I was told Thursday at the MDA clinic um, from the doctor that I was the only one of her muscular dystrophy patients, myotonic, everybody. Out of all her patients, I am the only one that wears my BiPAP. You have to wear it. Find the mask that fits you best. Find, um, find what works for you best. I wear the nasal pillows. You know, I'm not a mouth breather, therefore I can use those.
but save your heart the stress. It is very, very important. I have a son, my son is 32 years old, DM1, he refuses to wear his mask. I sit on his bed and I say, you have to wear it. I don't want him coming here one day and find you dead. Judy Marks, uh, I have DM2. Uh, my father had DM2 and both of my adult sons have it. I, we have certainly had our, our fair share of tragedy with this, but listening to folks, I just wanted to kind of add on to what that gentleman was saying um, and hold out my father as, as a reason to have some hope. Um, he made it to 87. His brother made it to 89. And he was able to retain extraordinary intellectual faculty and athletic ability into late into his life in his 70s. He could still run 12 miles on the beach at a stretch. Um, into his 80s, he could still testify in court for an entire day without notes. He was still writing books and journals, articles. Um, but he did, by his 80s, he, he'd lost a lot. Um, and he fell uh, and broke his hip because he was not using a rollator because he was stubborn. It was sitting right there. And although the surgery was considered a great success, he didn't last a month. Um, he couldn't swallow, he couldn't move. I mean, it just, when you talk about a triggering event, uh, breaking that hip was, was it for him. Um, others in our family, emotional stress has, has done it. For me, it was a flu that put me into it. Uh, can be a lot of different things, but I would like to say that, that, you know, he had a really good long life as did his brother, and um, that should, you know, give, give us all a little hope that it's, it's not always the worst trajectory that it can be. Hi, my name is Carrie Lonovich, and um, I was diagnosed with type 1 um, in 2012. Um, about six months before my son was born. He has the congenital form of it. Um, and I received it from my father, who actually spoke a little earlier about running. Um, but I had two kind of experiences that I wanted to share. The first was um, my pregnancy. Uh, that was really a big um, turn for the worse for me, I suppose. Um, during my pregnancy, my symptoms got worse. Um, I was tired much more easily, which obviously as part of pregnancy in general, but um, uh, that definitely worsened, and the stiffening in my legs and my arms and my neck and areas that I've never felt it before um, started happening. Um, so I don't think after he was born I ever got that back. Uh, the stiffening and everything is still right where it was, so that was definitely um, a place where I felt the progression really um, worsened there. Um, but recently I did um, take part in physical therapy and that definitely had um, some big significant changes for the better. Uh, strength overall, um, balance when I'm walking, um, energy to walk farther at a faster pace than I've ever been able to do. Um, unfortunately, I never really kept up with it after the appointments. <laughs> Being told, you got what you need, you can do it on your own at home, never really uh, worked for me. But uh, So I think the physical therapy is definitely um, a really helpful thing if you can get into it. Um, I take Adderall for daytime sleepiness, and um, I take Mexilatine for myotonia. Both of those have been really helpful for me. Um, antidepressants have helped quite a bit as well. And for me, I think um, seeing the progression slowed or stopped would be incredible um, for me personally and in my ability to take care of my son. Um, yeah. That could be something for him too. 
I would love to see that happen. And we want to thank you guys for the dedication that you're putting into all of this for us. Hi, um, I'm here. Uh, my name is Joachim Buchmann. I'm 51 years old. I was diagnosed in 2005. And uh, I just want to echo um, what a number of you said and uh, just the value of sort of limiting stress has helped me a lot. Um, physical exercise uh, is very helpful and it's very challenging. Um, I have, um, about a year ago, I started with my wife together, we started doing Pilates on a reformer, and I have to say that really helped a lot. Um, and just because it's so easy to adapt to um, my limitations, for example, if I can grip a certain handle, um, my trainer is going to give me another handle, and, and you know, if I can lift my uh, shoulders well, then we, we modify the exercise, and it really has helped a lot, and uh, I always hate going there, and I always like it when I'm done, so um, that, that's been really helpful. And then one, one thing, um, obviously any medication that would slow or stop the progression would be amazing, um, but sometimes I'm also thinking like, maybe for the in-between time, it would be really nice to have some little handy-dandy exoskeletons where that would help us lift our arms or, you know, move our legs better and, and um, um, so that's sort of the, the little sci-fi thing that I'm dreaming of. Thank you. Hi, I'm Erica Kelly and I am DM1 and I have two sons who are 18 and 20. And yesterday I was running one of the care panels and drew a total blank, so I am back to my notes. That helps a lot. I, I just wanted to really commend the panel. I thought that was really outstanding, and I'm sort of agreeing and re-emphasizing what you all said. That's amazing work. And for my two cents, the things I in particular agreed with was the, the benefit of antidepressants and drugs to help keep you awake are really worth giving a shot. Um, the therapy I also find tremendously, tremendously helpful. And then the exercise, and I wanted to, to talk about what the runner was saying as well. I found also sometimes I'm too tired to exercise, but if I do it, I feel a million times better. And if you don't exercise for a little while, it's hard to get back into it, but I think your mentality is the right one. Just do what you can, do a little bit. And I've been amazed, because I get awfully lazy during the summer. And then you just kind of start building up again, and you feel better, and you just have to change your goals, which is difficult for all of us. But as you said, you know, be proud of what you're doing, and you'll feel a little bit better. And the other one was stress, and I find stress to be the biggest trigger. You know, if you're, if you're, I get overwhelmed so easily. Like in my panel yesterday, I suddenly thought, oh my God, there's so much like that I want to say, and so much I want to do. And just to maybe take a deep breath and just give yourself a break. And as one of the speakers said too, sometimes you just miss a day. It's just not working out today and just you know, do what you need to do to take care of yourself and you'll recover more quickly. And I also want to say for all of us, these researchers, our research community is incredible and I want to really commend them. We, uh, we had our first MBF conference 10 years ago and for the first few conferences, all we could do is tell people what DM was. That was it. And as slowly, you know, the, the, our scientific and research community has moved so quickly. And I think all of us just need to hold on to the hope. Do what you can. Give yourself a break. Take whatever you can that helps right now. And just, just keep plugging ahead, because these guys are catching up with us quickly. And that's it. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jeremy Kelly, I'm Erica's husband. Um, the triggers that I've observed in changes with the disease, I mean, Erica's point about staying healthy, doing the best you can is so important because we've seen we, within her, her brother and sister both passed away from the disease 
and going in to have major surgery, uh, the body's ability to recover the far side of that, for anybody, surgery is a big challenge. But what I've observed is going into major surgery with myotonic dystrophy, it really does put a huge strain on the body. So from a trigger standpoint, that I think is something that people should focus on. I think the other thing is the lady's point uh, around pregnancy. I've just seen over the past 10 years at this conference, the number of times the major trigger event in a woman's life. You know, you learn about the baby having myotonic dystrophy, but it's actually, and, and all the challenges that come with that, but actually, you know, the baby aside, actually the change in the, uh, the physical effects of having had the baby, the major stress that the body goes through. So in terms of, you know, for the researchers and drug companies, you know, major things to focus on, I think that's an area which would, I think, bear a lot of fruit for the community. My name is Jill. I have DM2. My brother has DM1. One of the things I wanted to, to penetrate on what you said about women's cycles, um, I had more hand issues uh, since menopause. Menopause really triggered me to have a much more uh, tightening of my hands. So I just wanted to tie into that women's cycles a little different. Hi, my name's uh, John Armour, I'm 42. Um, I'm kind of like this, like this gentleman up here. Um, I've been an athlete all my life, and <clears throat> I was diagnosed three years ago. Um, first started noticing symptoms probably 20 years ago. I've always had an excuse for, you know, why I was feeling them. The first one being my hands. Um, I was a pretty high level athlete. Um, but like when my, when my hand started really bothering me, it's like I had just, I had just done a 24 hour mountain bike race. And so I just always had an excuse for, you know, why my hands were numb and cramping and they just hurt. So, about uh, 10 years ago, I switched to, to just running, endurance running, marathons mainly, and uh, I had some heart issues, arrhythmia, had the ablation back in 2008. In 2011 was my biggest year of, uh, of running, and I mean, training was just, was ingrained in me. It's like from the time when I was in high school and I could take on a high level. I mean, I was running 100 miles a week. And at the end of that season, well, it was, it wasn't the end of, it wasn't supposed to be the end of the season, but I just hit a wall and I've never hit a wall of training. And I just had to stop. I mean, I, I, wasn't enjoying it. My body was just taking forever to recover. And it was just, I just had to pull the plug. And it was the first time in my life I've ever done that. And so since then, it's just been reevaluating goals, um, especially after getting diagnosed. Who knows what, you know, what the future holds. But, uh, I've, I've gotten back to running, but it's nothing at the level that I was. I mean, I'm just, if I can get out and do three, four miles a day, I feel that's a success. I don't, I'm not hungry for it anymore. And sometimes it takes a lot of motivation to get out the door. But I found that that helped me as much mentally as it does uh, physically. Um, the other drug that, or the, 
the other drug that I've taken is uh, carbamazepine, which is for, uh, oh shit, I don't even know what it's for anymore. But anyway, it doesn't, that, that really has, that hasn't had any effect on me. I've tried to get it to use in some of the other ones that I've heard many people talk about, but because of my past cardiac issues, um, I can't get, I haven't been able to get prescribed that, so I'm ready to get a second opinion, but yeah, that's all I got. Hi, I'm David Herbert, and I have DM1, and I was thinking about the executive function comment that one of the earlier speakers made, and I have two daughters, our older daughter, uh, both of them were diagnosed around the time I was, but they were about 14 and 16. And our older daughter had done great in school through junior high, and then in senior high school, she just started bringing home Fs on her report card. And we'd say, how's it going? Are you studying? Yeah, it's going well. And then she'd come home with an F. And that was our sort of rude introduction to a decline in executive function, that she just wasn't pulling it together to study to get good grades, to sort of dig in, and wouldn't communicate that to us. So one solution, ultimately, she, we tried to send her to college a couple times. She bombed out both times. So we're thinking, OK, what are we going to do with this executive function? It's sort of like, Greta, if you study hard, you can get a degree, get a good job, and sort of executive function 101. But Ultimately, one of the things that worked for us, and not everyone can do this, but my wife fortunately said, Greta, let's you and I enroll in a course to get a health tech sort of prerequisite one year at the local junior college. They broke it down into daily sessions where they get together and quiz each other. It was almost sort of like a gaming thing. And rather than laying out this big, long, hard track, and she was dealing with fatigue and other issues, broke it down into bite-sized pieces. She got through it, got the health tech, and got a job. She's a hard worker, she's smart in the moment, but putting together that long road wasn't working. So those little bite-sized chunks got to that step that gave her a platform. So it worked for us. I, I had a follow-up question for you, sir. It's been impressive today to hear from people who are doing 24-hour um, mountain bike runs and marathons. And um, So you were working out intensively, and then you stopped cold turkey. Is that right? And then, and then what did you notice then um, when you did that? What, did anything happen? Uh, I mean, physically, I just couldn't do it, and and then mentally, it was it was kind of the same. It's like I just didn't want to go there anymore. It's like I didn't want to go to that that level of pain that I was, you know, dealt with on a on a daily basis. Um, and you know, it just it took me a long time to just to to get back to even wanting to you know do anything physically. So so what? So one question that comes up pretty often is, can a person overdo it? And um, at, we've heard a lot about the benefits of exercise, but is there any downside if people overdo it? I mean, was, when you stopped, did you feel like you had recovery, or did you feel like you had deterioration, or what did you notice? Uh, everything, all that. But, but the thing is, is, I mean, since I was 16 years old, I mean, I was racing at a pretty at a pretty high level, it's like, uh, I mean, t working out 20 hours a week plus, that, that was just, that was what was, that was my makeup, that was, I mean, so, I mean, I, as far as, I, I think I have a pretty good idea on when I'm overtraining, and, and I don't, I don't think that was the case, I think that was just the more earlier progression, the, of the disease. Great, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Mark Blanco. I'm 53 and I have DM1. 
Um, I mostly want to thank everyone from the researchers to the panelists to really every attendee for being here and sharing your experiences. Uh, I know for me and hopefully for a lot of people or everybody, the uh, conference should you know, we motivate you to, I'm sure we can all, you know, eat better and exercise more. It's, you know, to get me off the couch, uh, you know, more than I have and push through some of my fatigue. Um, definitely what triggers me to do worse is, is stress. And unfortunately, I have stress in in my professional life, my personal life, uh, family. So uh, it's a lot right now, but uh, I mean, we're dealing with it. The only other thing that I wanted to mention that no one has is for people in constant pain or living with a lot of pain, uh, one thing I've done recently is started to use some CBD oil and it's made a dramatic difference in my pain. Uh, first dose was able to actually get comfortable to sleep, which I was having a lot of. I could sleep anytime, anywhere. And now I was starting to have trouble because I was in pain no matter how I laid. CBD oil has made a big difference. Um, in Florida, you have to go to a special doctor to get a prescription for the CBD with the THC in it. Um, waiting on my card, because uh, I think the THC will provide more pain relief, but also help with the stress and anxiety that I have. Um, we talked in that lecture yesterday that a lot of people are getting a lot of relief and getting off a lot of bad meds with the uh, cannabis. So I think a lot of DM2 people that are in a lot of pain, or, or DM1, uh, may want to consider it. My name is Belen Paris, and I'm from Florida. I have a daughter with congenital um, DM type 1, and um, I wanted to, to say my opinion about what you mentioned about how much, how much exercise is too much. And I remember when she was diagnosed, she was eight years old when we saw Dr. Ashisawa for the first time, and she was taking dance classes after school um, three hours a week back then. And I remember Dr. Ashisawa telling me, you know, maybe with this condition, the exercise is important, but it, it might be too much. And back then I said, you know, if she can do it, if she doesn't complain about any major symptoms after that, she might as well do it. Well, she can. That was my approach. And I was mindful to watch, you know, when it was too much and try to not compare but check her, the way her, she felt after the classes compared to the other kids around her. Um, so this was several years ago. She's 13 and a half now. She dances 14 hours a week. And dance has been great. It has served as a form of therapy and we did physical therapy and occupational therapy the first year after she was diagnosed. One, it wasn't covered by the insurance. And two, she started asking me, why do I need therapy? What's wrong with me that I need therapy? Um, so at that point we said, you know what, you're gonna take any dance class you want. So she does tap, jazz, ballet, lyrical, contemporary, ballroom, I mean, you name it, if they offer it at the school, she has done it. And dance has been great because she doesn't have a lot of endurance, so she couldn't really run a marathon. You need you know, to be able to sustain the exercise for a long time in order to do that. But dance works depending on the type of dance you do, different muscle areas in your body. And she doesn't need to stay active for too long of a time 
you know, so it works. So for her, and again, I, I still keep that in mind. So I don't want her to be in significant pain or, you know, significantly fatigued. But I think exercise has made a difference in the way she is now compared to, you know, other, other kids with the same condition that maybe are not able to do so much exercise. So that's what I think. Hi, my name is uh, Donald Stewart. I go by Andrew. I just wanted to say that uh, I was diagnosed with DM1 2005 and the way I found out was I was in the army and I was doing what we do every morning PT and um, I jumped up on a pull-up bar and I fell down uh, several times and I think that was the biggest trigger was overdoing yourself is really going to make make it worse you should do what you can but don't like overexert yourself, you know, I could run six miles or, you know, do whatever I need to do. But at that point, it started getting worse. And it just got worse and worse and worse. And, you know, it's gotten worse throughout the time. But I think you should stay active as you can, but don't overdo it. Because um, it, uh, it can be disastrous. And to the gal who was talking about her son not using the BiPAP, use it. Because you know what? I go to the VA, and they don't care. They don't give a crap about me saying, I need a sleep study so I can see if I'm going to stop breathing. They don't care. I can't get a BiPAP because that's the only insurance I got. And they don't care. So use it. Thank you. Hi, my name is um, Nina DeSoy. I'm 28. Um, I was diagnosed about six months ago with DM1. Um, it was almost a relief to get a diagnosis, um, to know that there's something actually wrong with me. I'm not just lazy or um, all the little quirks that I've noticed over the years are actually caused by something and I'm not just weird. Um, I've had sleep problems since I was a baby, but I think in hindsight, a trigger for me was when I was 14, I became severely anemic my hemoglobin at that time was about 4.2. Um, it's gotten better. Uh, I'm no longer anemic, but I've never regained my stamina or endurance since I lost all of it at that time. I've never been able to regain the endurance I had before that, um, I used to run cross country. Um, I was one of the most promising freshmen on my high school team, but after becoming anemic, I was never um, really able to do well. Um, it was a struggle, definitely. And I think a lot of the symptoms that I have, the dysphagia, the mitonia, um, the weakness and fatigue, um, profound fatigue and daytime sleepiness have developed um, over my adolescence um, since I was 14. So it's definitely hard to know that maybe if things were different, I would be a different person. Um, but one of the things that I'm really excited about, um, the technology that's available today for me in terms of um, having children with IVF and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, um, I can maybe avoid the mental and 
um, psychological burden of passing this on to a child. Thank, thank you very much for, for those comments and to all the speakers. Everyone has done a great job. It, it's, I think, uh, with 400 people in the room, it takes a lot of courage to stand up. It's, it's not, uh, it was much more intimate when these gatherings started. And this is probably about as large as we can get and still be all friendly with one another in one room. So I think to, we're going to uh, thank the, the uh, panel of speakers again. So thank you, Dr. Thornton. Also, I wanted to thank the panelists. I mean, it was moving and inspirational, your stories. So thanks again. Um, and also uh, to the audience, uh, the participation was great. It was informative. Um, it was extremely powerful. And I do think it shows the strength of our community when we all work together and share. So thank you all.